On today's episode, delays continue for the Boeing Starliner, Mars sample return goes back to the drawing board, Voyager 1 is alive, and Stoke Space makes a new engine breakthrough. The Boeing Starliner, a spacecraft that became infamous for repeated launch delays, has now begun to experience landing delays. The latest update is that Starliner will return home from the ISS with astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams no earlier than June 26th. The crew's original departure date had been set for June 13th, which was then delayed to the 18th, then the 22nd, and now we have the current date which was set by NASA and Boeing at a press conference on Tuesday. Officials report that Starliner can spend a maximum of 45 days docked to the ISS in its current state. This delayed Starliner's approach to the ISS docking module by over an hour, as five of the ship's thrusters were offline during various phases of the maneuvering procedure. This issue would have prevented Starliner from successfully docking, however, Boeing engineers were able to get four of the problematic thrusters back online to complete the mission. So what's going on? Well, Starliner did experience some additional systems malfunctions on its journey from the Earth to the ISS, the most troubling of which would be the intermittent failure of some reaction control thrusters. This delayed Starliner's approach to the ISS docking module by over an hour, as five of the ship's thrusters were offline during various phases of the maneuvering procedure. This issue would have prevented Starliner from successfully docking, however, Boeing engineers were able to get four of the problematic thrusters back online to complete the mission. Now, it's worth noting that during Starliner's second uncrewed test flight, which was in 2022, the same thrusters in the same location also had issues, and NASA's commercial crew program manager Steve Stitch said that we don't understand quite why they're happening. The reason given that a thruster issue was able to be solved from the ground was that this is not necessarily a hardware problem, it's a software problem. The computer on board is reading the thrusters as performing out of spec and then shutting them down out of an abundance of caution. Apparently too cautious, however, which is not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to spaceflight. In addition to that weirdness, a Starliner also experienced some more problems with helium gas leakage. The new leaks were still being detected even after the Starliner had docked to the ISS, bringing the total to five leaks on this particular mission. This is not exactly a huge deal. Helium is the second lightest element in the known universe, and it does have a tendency to escape even the best made seals. NASA has assured us that Starliner has more than enough helium gas to safely return to the Earth. And if you're wondering what a spaceship needs so much helium for anyway, it's all about pressurization. In order to keep the entire vehicle strong and rigid, we need to constantly repressurize those tanks with the lightest and most non-reactive element that we have available, which is helium. The initial return delay for Starliner was a scheduling conflict with a spacewalk that was going to be performed on the ISS, although that itself ended up being delayed because of a discomfort issue with the spacesuit. The idea was that the crew didn't want a spacewalk and a vehicle departure happening at the same time, but they ended up with neither of those things. So Boeing decided that if they're already waiting, then they might as well wait a little longer and perform some extra testing on their vehicle. So this is actually pretty cool. Starliner will perform a hot fire test of its aft facing thrusters. Uh, seven of the eight thrusters will be fired in two pulses with a total duration of about one second. This would be the same problematic thruster section that we mentioned before. NASA said that this test will demonstrate how the spacecraft will perform when docked to the station on future missions lasting up to six months. Other work planned for the extended stay includes the cabin air temperature measurements to compare against readings from the spacecraft's life support system, conducting additional tests of the spacecraft's hatch and forward window, and then repeating a safe haven test, which is where they try and cram four people into the capsule for a simulated emergency, like if everyone had to bail out of the space station. Starliner is designed to hold up to a maximum capacity of seven people if need be. The eventual goal for Starliner is to have it fly one mission to the ISS every year and remain docked for six to seven months at a time. So far, we have nothing to indicate that Starliner will have any issues with a return to Earth. NASA's Steve Stitch told reporters on Tuesday that the new delay was, quote, 
to give our team a little more time to look at the data, to do some analysis, and to make sure that we're really ready to come home. Although this first shakedown cruise has not been flawless, it's likely been good enough for NASA to now add a second crewed vehicle to their lineup, alongside the SpaceX Dragon, and hopefully we'll soon be seeing a third option with the Sierra Space Dream Chaser coming very soon, so keep a lookout for that, and safe trip to Butch and Sunny. Space Race is now coming directly to your inbox. We are launching the official Space Race newsletter, where you can get all the most important space news delivered to you in an easy-to-read format each week. Click the link in the description or go to www.thespacerace.news to sign up today. NASA's Mars Sample Return mission has returned to the drawing board in search of a new solution to effectively and affordably bring home the valuable Martian soil that has been collected by the Perseverance rover in its ongoing mission across the Jezero crater. The basin where the rover has been operating for the past three years was once home to flowing water on the red planet, billions of years in the past, and was a likely candidate to harbor the most basic forms of Martian life if they ever existed at all. So the material that's been dug up and packaged by this machine will be massively, historically significant, even if there is no fossilized bacteria in there. But if there is, then that would be pretty frigging epic. There's a big problem though. We've got all of these pristine samples just waiting around on the surface of Mars, and there is no legitimate plan for how we'll actually get them into the hands of scientists on the Earth. There was a plan. NASA said that they had this whole thing worked out, but then recently admitted that there just wasn't enough funding available to get the job done within any reasonable time frame. So, blame Congress. Anyway, instead of trying to fight a losing battle with the politicians, NASA is looking to the private sector to bail them out. Yet again. This is the new trend in space exploration, and it's not necessarily all bad. The plan right now is to have everyone put their heads together and try to come up with some innovative solutions to the problem at hand. NASA is seeking proposals for the most cost-effective and rapid methods of getting these samples home. This will consist of three internal studies by NASA and the John Hopkins University of Applied Physics Laboratory, and in addition, NASA has selected seven commercial partners for fixed-price contracts up to $1.5 million to conduct their own 90-day studies. And then, once all of that is complete, NASA will decide which proposals they'll integrate into the sample return mission architecture. So, we have the usual suspects for American spaceflight, Lockheed Martin, Aerojet Rocketdyne, and Northrop Grumman all have their own plans with very convoluted names. Then there's SpaceX, who will propose enabling Mars sample return with Starship. Blue Origin is in the mix as well with their plan called Leveraging Artemis for Mars Sample Return. And we've also got a relative newcomer, that's Quantum Space, who want to try something called Quantum Anchor Leg Mars Sample Return Study. Either way, we'll have to wait three months before we get to see what they've all come up with, and that's something really cool to look forward to. We've got great news coming in from deep space. Voyager 1 is back online. NASA confirms that the remaining four scientific instruments on board the nearly 50-year-old spacecraft are returning science data for the first time since a computer malfunction last November. The hardware on Voyager 1 is still able to measure plasma waves, magnetic fields, and particles in interstellar space. The probe is currently in between the outer edge of our solar system and the sphere of material that surrounds it. This is known as the Oort Cloud although it will take another 300 years or so for the probe to actually reach that cloud. Back to the emergency fix though. When Voyager started transmitting garbled nonsense in November 2023, NASA assembled what they call a Tiger Team of engineers to track down the problem and develop a solution. It was found that a corrupted memory chip in the 1970s era computer was responsible for the scrambled data. So this Tiger team was able to rewrite the probe's software to avoid using that chip. After the firmware upgrade was broadcasted out over 24 billion kilometers, the communication was finally restored. Hopes are higher than ever that both Voyager probes will be functional at least until their 50th birthday party in 2027. And if we can squeeze one more decade out of Voyager 1's systems, it will reach 200 astronomical units in 2035. That's 200 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, or 30 billion kilometers away. 
Stoke Space is a pioneering startup company working towards the goal of building a fully reusable launch vehicle called Nova. Recently, they achieved a major milestone by successfully test firing a new engine that could revolutionize space access. The Nova engine employs a full flow stage combustion design. This advanced technology offers greater efficiency and a longer engine life. It's crucial for achieving the high thrust to weight ratios needed for reliable, reusable, efficient launch vehicles. Currently, only the SpaceX Raptor engine uses this sophisticated design. The test lasted two seconds, with the engine producing 50% of its rated thrust. The goal was to demonstrate the engine's ability to start up and shut down successfully, and to test its performance under various conditions. This successful test is a significant milestone for Stoke Space, marking the first time they have tested a full-flow stage combustion engine. In a recent interview, Stoke's CEO Andy Lapsa highlighted that the test occurred just 18 months after the company started designing the engine. He expressed confidence in the technology, suggesting that high-performance engines like the Nova will render lower-performing variants obsolete over time. He also emphasized the importance of this technological achievement, saying, quote, I think it's an essential technology mountain to climb, and I'm really excited to be on that mountain. The importance of this achievement cannot be overstated. Widespread adoption of reusable launch technology has the potential to drastically reduce the cost of access to outer space. Looking ahead, Lapsa shared that Stoke Space aims to begin orbital test flights in 2025, with hopes to accelerate this schedule where possible. However, the timeline depends on when they can start work on their launch site at Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 14, which has been allocated to them by the US Space Force last year.